Thanks. Well, JSC was a little too nice. Um, you know, the truth is he hired me into Kellogg's, which if you're Tom Chavez here in the audience, you might want to question his decision making, given that you gave him the title of Chief Strategy Officer on that. But, uh, but yes, thank you very much, JSD. And I will try to get through some material very quickly because I like JSD. I think you guys are going to love hearing from the group of uh, marketers that we're going to bring up on stage. And so I thought it was only appropriate to start with this. Uh, I remember it was almost five years ago now that JSD, I was brand new at Kellogg, and he said, hey, listen, we need to go talk to the CMO, and I'm three months into the, my job at Kellogg, so we need to go talk to the CMO and explain to him what it is that we're gonna try to do in, in analytics. Like, now we're kicking off this big program. We've gotta go explain to him all these metrics we wanna collect and how we're gonna analyze data and use it and, and all this stuff. And I go, okay, all right, how do, how do we get this message across to the CMO? So I thought this was appropriate because Michael Lewis is going to be here tomorrow, so I'm very excited about that. Um, I said, okay, JC, I'm going to do it this way. I think there's a clear analogy between what we want to do with data and analytics and the story behind Moneyball, right? And so there are lessons that I think we can learn and apply from the ideas of Moneyball. So what we did is we said, number one, the idea behind Moneyball was it's about getting the most out of every dollar you have, recognizing that we're not all the New York Yankees. Our CMO is British, so we threw in the Chelsea Football Club uh, so he could relate. But the reality is we really want to figure out how do we maximize the impact of every dollar spent, which is the same thing that Billy Bean and the Oakland Athletics were doing in the story of Moneyball. And how do they go about that? One of the mindset shifts that they drove, right, is that you don't buy players Think about buying wins. And all baseball teams to this point have been based on buying players. But the reality is you should relook at that and say, how do I buy wins? And the same thing is true in the media world, we believe. We said, okay, I'm not worried so much about the individual properties I'm buying and things like that. I'm more interested in what do I buy that leads to wins? So that led to the next question, which was, how do we know what is indicative of wins? And this is what they did in money. This is what sabermatics, the math behind Moneyball is all about, right? It's about identifying statistics that were actually indicative of winning games versus statistics that were easy to count. So in baseball, that was going from the home run and the RBI to something like on base percentage and wins above replacement. Fascinating stuff, great stuff. Uh, you know, in the media world, you know, one of the first easy analogies to make was, well, we're Kellogg's, we're a brand-based company. This is about going from click-through rates to something like reaching my target in view, a valid impression, putting a valid impression in front of the people we actually want to talk to, uh, managing frequency, things like that, right? So I came out here today, yeah, I prepared this, and I thought this is going to be great. I'll set this up and convince everybody in the audience that we really knew what we were doing, and it's all about data-driven marketing. But then this happened. Everyone's seen, uh, who's seen the Chewbacca lady? A lot? Yes, I would imagine the numbers would dictate many of you have seen Chewbacca lady, I'll just refer to her. And this kind of blew my mind over the weekend because I'm thinking, wow, uh, she's got, I don't know, 14 gazillion hits at this point of this video that she, she did use Facebook Live to post this video, and it's just exploded. It's all over the internet, but not only the internet, and this is a, a discussion about cross-platform, right? You can see the screenshots are her being interviewed on Good Morning America. So now she's going cross-platform. It's not just Facebook. She's on television. She's going to be everywhere before this is over. I can guarantee that. But what, was, what struck me about this is the title of our, our session today is The Art and Science of Cross-Platform Measurement and Analytics. And I think this speaks to the art, right? And my point here is that all the data in the world could not have predicted that this lady was going to get on Facebook, put on a mask and laugh, and we would all watch it. And, you know, I don't know if there's anyone from Kohl's that happens to be in the room, but God, I would love to see same store sales data for this week at Kohl's versus last week. Because she bought the mask at Kohl's, she mentions them multiple times, people were commenting, I can't wait to go to Kohl's, I gotta buy this mask. So this really is a story of art and science. It's not all just the science and the data. There's an art behind great marketing and who could have predicted this, right? 
All right, so very quickly, um, just Comscore. Why am I here? Why is it even relevant? Uh, what I say is that Comscore measures what matters. I don't want to focus it on any one metric. We just measure what matters to make cross-platform audiences and advertising more valuable. That's our statement. That's our value statement to the entire media ecosystem. And we really believe that with today's internet, it's, it's basically a never-ending internet. So you, if you're going to provide measure for that, you have to be everywhere. And why do I say that? We have an initiative called the Total Home Panel right now, and it's a growing panel where we recruit households to place a, a device at the router level that allows us to track all activity, internet-based activity in the household. So we see everything from connected TVs, computers, uh, you know, iPads, iPods, to OTT devices, everything. If you have a connected refrigerator that orders milk, we'll see that. Um, and what we're seeing on, on an early basis from that is that you can see these stats. On average, the average household has at least 10 active devices, and you can all kind of sit there and start to count up in your head how many are in my house. And I would imagine many of you will quickly get up to the 15 to 20 range. And you can see as the number of people in your household go up, that number of devices goes up. This is really indicative of the reality that we live in, right? Very cross-platform. There's nothing uniform about it. Attention has splintered across so many different devices. And so with, along with that, these are the questions that we hear. As I go around the country talking to different marketers, you know, these are the big questions that are on their mind. How do I best define my target audience and what data is most effective at reaching them? How can my brand grow in this increasingly fragmented world? I mean, growth, we've talked about it already uh, earlier today. Growth is imperative, but how do I grow? Um, how does traditional TV and video evolve? How can I ensure that my consumers are seeing my message enough, but not too much, I'm not wasting it? In, in excess frequencies. And at the end of the day, I think you've heard it already and these guys will talk about it, how do I ensure that I'm maximizing reach across all media platforms? So I'm investing in all these 10 plus devices to be there, but is that really helping to grow my reach as a brand or am I missing some of my audience? These are big questions. The way that Comscore is trying to go about helping marketers solve these and answer these is number one, we believe just fundamentally precision requires scale. This is our screens under measurement slide, if you will. Um, historically, I think you probably all know Comscore as the, the measurement company for the web and digital, so we've obviously got a, a great coverage in, in that space. We recently acquired a company called Rentrack, which brings to the table 36 million set-top boxes of TV data. So we see everything that those households are consuming on television. We're also seeing their digital consumption. We also cover movie theaters. The box office results are now covered by Comscore as part of our Rentrack merger. So this is, this is the scale that we believe is necessary to build measurement and analytics solutions of the future. And what it leads to is this, the world's largest single source information set for observed TV, desktop, mobile device usage, right? We have 10 million people plus where we now see definitively what they're seeing on TV, what they're seeing online, what they're seeing on their phone, and we can begin to now build deduplicated audiences and metrics out of that, right? So with that in mind, let's just talk about a real quick, a very few cross-platform realities. I always start with this. It's a quote from Erwin Gottlieb, the chairman of uh, Group M. He made this at our Comscore Industry Summit last September. And it just basically starts with, we have to get better at cross-platform measurement. You'll hear from these guys today. I would challenge whether any of them feel really confident in knowing what's happening across platforms today. And why is this so imperative? Well, there's more media platforms competing for more time, as we said. With millennials, this is some data from our own, uh, our own data set, millennials are now spending more time with digital and desktop, mobile and desktop digital devices than they are television. So the tipping, we've reached that tipping point where the time spent is shifting across devices. And mobile in particular now consumes two out of every three minutes of digital time spent. So you as an individual, all of your time spent with digital devices, two out of every three minutes are on a mobile device and smartphone apps are driving the majority of that. Mobile, amazing, we've well passed the tipping point. Uh, when we look at uh, cable networks, why is cross-platform so important to a cable network or a broadcast network? Well, looking at real data, if you're only looking at a TV audience, you're missing about a third of the total audience, deduplicated audience that that property is reaching. And that's what this is showing here is when you start to look at the unduplicated and duplicated audience across desktop, mobile, and put that together, those networks, those platforms have a much bigger audience than they may be given credit for. 
If you're a brand or an uh, agency trying to build a media plan, you know, in theory, this slide's really meant to be an in theory slide, I could just choose a very simple media plan, one major primetime network and YouTube. And if I invested appropriately in each of those, I can essentially reach the entirety of 18 to 34 year olds in the US. That's amazing, just two simple media properties. I could do that, but you've gotta have this kind of information to understand is that possible. And then finally as a marketer, marketers wanna know, all right, I delivered a campaign across all these devices, did I get the reach? Where did the incremental reach come from? So this just represents unduplicated reach and frequency across devices, which is kind of what we've been asking for for a long time. But it, re it requires the scale to have precise metrics. And then I'll, I'll have to throw up uh, back to JST and I's Kellogg days. We've known for a long time that effectiveness grows as campaigns become cross-platform. What this shows is kind of indexed to Campaigns that were TV only, how much volume did they drive off the shelf? And then we looked at all the campaigns that had TV plus print, TV plus digital, TV plus print and digital, and you can see the very clear increase in effectiveness. So we were driving more volume per impression in the marketplace out of those campaigns that became cross-platform, right? So it was an imperative that we get there. And then just to put this all in context before I bring the group up, the idea of cross-platform measurement uh, it was a year or so ago or so, I really noticed a shift in the way marketers were talking. They said, it's not enough to measure. It's great that I got all these metrics, but I've got to do something with that data. I can't get an after the fact report. It's too late at that point. I want to activate off of that data, right? So the way that we're enabling this with partners like Crux is we can provide very discreet, what we would call impression level data of all your, who's seeing your ads? Where are they seeing them? Are they responding? Uh, who's seeing television? If you want a television audience, if you want a, a digital audience, audiences that watch CSI, whatever, we can feed that into a platform like Crux to be activated off of you. I think you just heard one of the young engineers saying, hey, I'm working on data activation. That's this. This is activating data that's coming from a cross-platform system, right? And you, we've got a great case study with Kellogg's that Amaya can reference where we're doing that to suppress invalid traffic through Crux, and that gets passed out then to the media partners. So this is a very simple model that's already come to life, and it's why cross-platform measurement is key in this, I would call it, data-driven ecosystem, right? So with that, without further ado, I'm going to introduce and ask my panel to come out. So joining me on stage will be Blaise Da Silva, I think. Uh-oh. Get the stool all the way, okay. <laughs> Blaze, thanks, VP at Dr. Pepper Snapple Group of Media. Baba Shetty, the CEO of Invisible Science, as JSD mentioned. Fernando Ariola, anywhere, yeah, I'll go over there. Fernando, VP Marketing at Conagra, and Amaya Garbayo, Associate Director of Media at Kellogg's. Guys, thanks for joining me. All right, so I'll just start with what I kind of set up. Who feels confident or not so confident in any metrics you have today that are cross-platform? Fernando, I'm, you're right here, so I'll just go to you. Uh, I would say probably middle of the road. Like I think there's still a lot of work to be done with cross-platform. Um, I think we've come, made pretty good strides over the last few years, but there's still a lot of analog um, platforms as well as the digital platforms that um, we can't get good data for both of them. So I think we're on a journey and um, the thing that we're looking at is the most important thing we do right now is continue to learn and continue to change our culture so that when we do get to an end point and we get better data, we'll be better prepared for it. Awesome. And um, Blaze Amaya, I'm uh, curious from your perspectives. Sure, I think um, obviously we've made great strides. I think you know, some of the slides that you set up there with Comscore showing all the things that you guys are trying to do and really push the ecosystem forward. It is still very challenging for us and I don't think today that we have really good cross-channel measurement and part of that is due to a little bit what Fernando alluded to there of you know, there are still some walled gardens in the digital space that don't allow us to measure our entire plans in totality, so one of the frustrations that I have is we're spending a lot of money doing measurement that is incomplete and doesn't give us the full picture, and we as marketers need that full picture, so 
you know, obviously the efforts that you guys are making, but we as an industry, the advertisers and the agencies really need to push hard on some of the, you know, media companies that are not allowing us to measure things the way we need to measure them. Yeah, Maya. I think I would go a step further. I think, rightfully so, there are advances that have been made, but I feel like channels multiply on their ass a lot faster than when able to track them. So if you look at... A couple of years back, um, maybe we have you know that middle of the road. Today, I think we're below that because there are a lot more channels that have appeared in the last couple of years that are outside the measurement, cross media measurement space, and I think that that is only going to go and get worse. So it, it's clear that we need Don't get me faster. Wrong. I, I understand the challenges. I mean, with the, just the way people are consuming, you know, just look at video, the way people are consuming video, and how hard it is to measure all the different places that people yeah. are consuming it. So I recognize the challenges that the measurement companies have and, 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 and respect what they're trying to do in bringing us forward. My emphasis is on the partners who are not allowing us to, be, to measure that yeah. and not allowing you guys to measure it the way we need to have it measured. So, Baba, you left the media space uh, proper, the agency space proper, to kind of start an analytics company. Um, what are you seeing? Is there progress? Do you feel like there's progress being made to some of these challenges that these three have just talked about? There is progress, but the, the extent of the challenge is, is enormous. So, you know, the, the whole idea that, you know, we're living through a period right now where the explosion of new touch points, not just the explosion of them, but the hyper adoption of them by huge groups of consumers. I mean, look at the Snapchat phenomenon of the last Absolutely. 18 months, yeah. right? Uh, where it, it, it has gone from zero to a, if, if you're a certain kind of marketer, a fundamental channel, right, of interaction. So uh, I think this, this period is one that is incredibly challenging, but I don't think it's gonna get easier either. I think that this, this kind of evolution is gonna continue. So it's, it's just kind of a characteristic of the era that we're in that uh, part of the challenge of being a marketer is to try to get to solutions for what's probably gonna be the the environment for quite a while now. Yeah, so I always wanted this, uh, and Blaze, maybe I'll look at you here. I, I always said, to, to that point, to Baba's exact point, Snapchat's exploded, other things exploded, and as a marketer, you would, you would sit there and have 20 vendors a day come in and say, I'm the next place you should be spending a million dollars with, right? And we all know marketers have finite budgets, and they rarely shift that dramatically year over year. How do you start to make these calls? How do you evaluate the effectiveness of a Snapchat at, the, at its ability to drive your brand growth relative to other things that you are more familiar with? I mean, obviously part of that is, is a leap of faith when you look at some of the things that are out there, um, but understanding consumer behavior and where they're spending their time and if it's relevant for your target, then you, know, you, you, you do want to take a, a, an approach of, hey, I got to try some things. When we can put measures in place, and we always try to put measures in place, but you know, we may not be ready to do that, but we still need to figure out, is there any types of measures that we can do? But ultimately, you have to understand you know, from the consumer point of view, how am I going to reach them? How am I going to impact them? How am I going to garner their attention? And as you find these platforms where they're starting to, that, are, that are newer and starting to spend their time, and they may not be you know, as measurable, you do have to take a leap of faith with some of these. You guys do that, Fernando? You take a leap of faith? Um, it, it can manifest itself in a couple of ways. We have some uh, brand people who are more comfortable um, doing something that's a little bit riskier and we, others who are a little bit more nervous. Um, there's a few things we've done. Um, for some new, new platforms, we'll have um, funds set aside that aren't tied to business results and we'll basically use those funds just to assess new platforms. The key thing we need there is just learnings to know if it's gonna work or not, and sometimes they don't work, sometimes they do, sometimes they go out of business. Um, but the cool thing is when they work, then you can take them to the brand guys and say, hey, we have a, a case that worked. Um, in other situations, if we have a good rapport with the brand people and maybe they have a brand that's a little bit more forward-leaning, um, that they don't mind putting themselves out there because their perception is kind of it telegraphs that they're a more contemporary brand, um, we can do it with them, and it's, it's not driven as much by immediate business results, but maybe other things, and a lot of times trying to negotiate with that partner to learnings, too, is, is helpful. Yeah. So, Maya, I'll ask you somewhat of an extension on that, um, knowing what, what I know of uh, your passion for the analytics space. What m metric of the things that marketers are measuring, where they can measure things, what metric are, are marketers probably not paying enough attention to right now? Oh, the list. Um, I, I think... 
I, I don't know if the, it was the one that they are not paying enough attention to. The, the one that I think has been fundamental for us and we've been very much watching over is been reach. Um, I think, and here is where cross-platform cross plays so much of a role, right? Because um, we've been talking about reaching the right consumer, and reaching the right consumer means reaching them wherever they are. Consumer is the true north, and everything that has been talked about, um, both of you, implies that you need to follow them wherever they are. Um, and so with that in mind, I think reaching the consumer, the, the impression, valid impression that is viewable against a human in the platform of their choice is the metric that at the very least we should be paying most attention to at this point. Okay, yeah. So I'll shift gears a little bit here. Baba, Chewbacca lady, like yeah. I said, all the data in the world could not have predicted that was a piece of essentially creative that resonated with everyone, it would appear, right? Um, we're not talking about creative very much. Why is that? As we talk about data yeah, across we, platform. We, we need to. Um, so, so this, this company that I just launched is called Invisible Science, and the kind of phrase where that comes from is this idea that there's two things that extraordinary brands have to focus on to be successful in this era, and that is the visible art of the brand, which is the narrative and the voice and the content and the creative and the kind of the presentation layer of the brand, and then the, the stuff that isn't so, is actually invisible to the consumer. The science, the empirical database approach behind it. And uh, the thing is you're always gonna need both. And I think one of the issues that has happened is we've gotten a little bit splintered off in those two worlds. And we've gotta reintroduce those two worlds to each other. So it, it just so happened that a lot of the data-driven analytical approaches to marketing were very media-centric to begin with. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, people, people respond to uh, a brand touch that is both a message and a placement, right? Yeah. And um, there's a lot that says that actually the, the messaging component of it is actually the, mo the most important, most impactful piece of it. Absolutely. So, um, I think we, we were having a little sidebar discussion a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, the whole, the whole creative complexity that comes along with what we are now able to do with programmatic or data-driven approaches to, to media is, is a huge challenge for, for the industry. And I, I actually think the next great wave of innovation and hopefully the case studies that we're all going to be hearing about over the next 18 months, 24 months, are gonna be the application of content and creative matched with the data and insight from the pipes we've already laid. Awesome. Yeah, so, I, would, so. I would totally agree with that. It seems, it's interesting, um, I thought when the um, woman from Meredith was up here earlier today and she talked about Meredith having a um, direct response history and how big of a deal that's been in their transition to digital, I thought about our industry which, um, I mean we have brand people who will spend six months working on one TV spot and that has to change because you can't get to more nimble creative by doing that, um, especially if we want to take what the gentleman right before us here we're talking about in terms of, hey, you have all these data points that you're aligning. Now I can say, hey, I know that this kid is consuming a product, so I'm going to give that kid a message. I know that the mom has a different mindset about it. She'll get a slightly different message. And I think there's a big opportunity there, but I think it calls for a lot of change. But I agree with Bob. I think there's a big opportunity there if we can harness it. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how do we... How do we go about it? Or what's your thought? Blaze, you referenced it as the bifurcation of marketing. We need to bring it back together. Yeah, I mean, just two things, to, just echoing what Bob said, um, one about the idea, and I think, I, I, you know, one of the things that I think about, it's kind of, you know, one of my principles, or what do I stand for? And it really just start with the idea, like ideas do matter. And I think about our company and some of the marketing that we've done over the last, you know, 18 to 24 months, and two of our most successful campaigns have been led by, by really great ideas, you know, um, Part of our success for Dr. Pepper has been through our college football sponsorship and the idea around Larry Culpepper, the vendor um, that we introduced two years ago. And then also with Diet Dr. Pepper in a category that's very challenging, part of its success is due to the campaign with Little Sweet. And we will be bringing back this year for a second year. So we've seen success with great ideas. So I always start with that and then kind of build upon that. But this idea um, that you're talking about where you know the idea and, and, and the data kind of went different directions and need to come back, you know, it's, it's, for those of us who've been in the business for a while, we know that in the 90s, 
the media departments had to split off from the advertising agencies in order to you know, get that importance that they needed in the whole marketing ecosystem. Totally get it, was part of a media agent, uh, ad agency and then part of the media agency back then and totally get why that had to happen. But now it's almost like you have to, they had to separate to now integrate. And I think as we all, as marketers, see the challenges that we face and the complexity and the fragmentation, getting the media and the creative and the digital all together on the same page, to me leads that, hey, we need to bring it back together. And I'd, I'd, I'd argue with you that, that, hey, the media agencies really need to get focused you know, on media and on data and, really, and analytics and get that expertise up and let the you know, creative agencies or digital, agency, digital agencies focus on the ideas and the creative messaging. I think in some cases the media agencies have tried to stray, stray a little too far in being almost a full service creative agency and that's also created challenges and conflict within the ecosystem. So I totally buy into that, hey, it's gotta come back together and it's gotta come back together as one. And it's a challenge because we're all working with different agency partners that may not be part of the same holding company which creates its own challenges in and of itself. Absolutely. Well, and, and Bob and Amaya, both having fairly recently come from the agency world, I mean, I'm definitely interested in your perspective. Um, as you look at even what Crux was introducing, I think, today with the new the IMH, um, these kind of introductions of technology or tools are fundamentally shifting the model we're used to, uh, I think. Right? So, very curious. Where do you see this going? How do agencies evolve to bring incremental value the, from where they are today based on the capabilities that are being introduced in the marketplace. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to highlight is the part where the, both creative and media agencies come sooner into the process together um, to bring the best final product is fundamental because that idea of chasing the consumer in whichever platform that consumer is cannot happen if the assets that are needed to chase them are not created. Like, I can't you know, have a plan that intends to go after a consumer in Instagram and then my creative agency happens not to have one. Um, and so, and, and that is, it seems silly, but I'm sure there are multiple occasions where that has happened, that um, we, we end up in a place where um, the choices we've made further up the, the chain um, are not corresponding to, to some of the choices we made in the media side of things. So, I mean, bringing it together upstream, I think is, is fundamental to the success. And I think a lot of media agencies are coming back a little bit to that model where they might not be together, but certainly they are at the room together at the beginning of that briefing process to address that, because I think it's fundamental to, to the success. I, I think the, uh, the enabling technology of, of things like the Intelligent Marketing Hub are, are gonna be so key because what, what you want is you want alignment among a broad group of people who bring lots of talent to the table and uh, whether it's internal on the client side or across the whole kind of ecosystem of partners and I would say even beyond agencies I would say media companies publishers data partners um, you got to have some sort of alignment and I, I actually think uh, another huge challenge we have as an industry is that the tools have gotten ahead of the culture and uh, the t the, what you can do today, the power of these tools fully deployed has exceeded the capability of most organizations to actually execute against that possibility, right? So um, I, I almost think of it like a, like a graph where the, the, a the absolute threshold is what, what does the technology allow you to accomplish? And another graph of how sophisticated is your organization actually meeting that, that kind of frontier, right? So um, one place I'd, I'd dive into specifically is how we think about marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time, marketing strategy uh, at the highest level has kind of oriented itself around uh, positioning and, uh, and uh, brand creative development. And that's still critically important. It's you know the visible art and the invisible science, right? So that's still critically important. But today, the different thing is, and we talked about this during our, our prep call, right? Where it's like, you can't stop there. You can't stop there with one archetype that kind of represents yeah. this definitive persona <laughs> yep. that you get everybody saying, that is who our customer is. 
Um, if you do, then all the other tools and the data don't matter, right? Yeah. So you got to get a strategic process that says, all right, got it. You know, we've got our master narrative, but we also have to get a complete story and experience across a sequence of marketing touches for this group of people that has these specific needs and mindsets and, and requirements from our brand, right? Yep. And that's a different kind of strategic process. Yep, absolutely. I loved, uh, there, was, there was some line up here earlier from one of the, the Crux presentations, I think it said something to the effect of more data, simple algorithms is greater than less data and complex algorithms, right? Which I think speaks to, um, I, I have this question for you guys. Um, as you're building these personas, and I know you all are, you're building personas and targetable audiences. Let's just be honest, is the data any good? Is the data any good? What's the confidence level in the data we use to build these apparently known audiences? Um, I, so uh, we'll never know how good all the data is. I think um, the, the bigger danger to, to Baba's point is I think the people who are using the data, like I think there's a natural um, run to, oh, if I can target more effectively, I'm going to target these people who are the highest potential people, and it gets really narrow and small, and there's a lot of time and energy, and you're paying for a lot of stuff, and it gets really expensive, and suddenly, for all, I mean, we're all on scale businesses, right? Yep. You've, you've minimized yourself into nothing and spent a lot of money for it. So I think the more interesting thing is, to what Baba said, it's like, how can we get people to ima completely reimagine how they, um, how they think about their work. So the, 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 the thing that I've always paired around in ConAgra is, we, historically we've been bound by um, the medium, so like let's say TV um, and its TV schedule. What if you could say, hey, based on when this person purchases it, I have those dots filled in that he talked about earlier. Yep. I know that this person purchased this product here. They'll be back in the market here because we know their past purchase cycle. So instead of going on and off every week with TV, we're going to, re-engage them with whatever the marketing encounter is right before the purchase cycle starts again. And that is, for our brand guys, that complete, that's a complete change. And so I think the way we think about it is, it's not the data as much, because I think the data is fine and it will continue to get better, but how can we get cultural change so people can completely reimagine their, their jobs? I think that's where the huge opportunity is. That's amazing. I, I mean, I, I think there's pieces of the data that, that are good and there's pieces that we're probably not so sure about. I, you know, I think the data that we get that saying that, you know, this household has bought these things is probably pretty accurate. The, the challenges we all are facing is how do we bring together for the, you know, the unique idea or the individual idea and then go out and target them. And that's what this, we're all in this business, this technology and data, that's what, you know, that's kind of the crux of the whole thing, right? That's, that's why this company is, right? <laughs> so that's, you know, that is the challenge and we're trying to get better at it. And, you know, that's why we keep you know, we're doing it, we're testing and we're learning and we're measuring the best we can, but we do, we are dealing with a lot of art here because there is some incompleteness to this whole process that we just all have to recognize. We're trying to measure, we're trying to do closed loop studies, we're doing all these things, brand lift studies, whatever, trying to get whatever pieces of measurement that we can kind of jigsaw together to understand yep. and then kind of work with it. But you asked me my confidence level, I don't know. It's probably between 50 and 70% at this point in time. But I'll tell you one of the things that I, I do look at a lot, and we've gotten better and better at, at Dr. Pepper Snapple Group over the last three years, is our market mix modeling. We're providing better and better data to our market mix modeling company, and the more granular of the data that we provide, the, the better information we're getting out of it. And so that's really telling us a lot of things about what is and isn't working. And the reason why I like it is it gives me a, a holistic picture of everything that I do. There's, no, there's nothing that isn't part of my media plan or my marketing mix that isn't measured in that. So to me, that's right now, and it's telling me some really interesting things. That is the best measure that I have in totality. And then ultimately sales. How's my sales, how are my sales doing? Yep. Absolutely. I have to say I am very much in that camp. What we have uncovered is that at the very least for the sources that we tackle today, uh, Kellogg, the data that we are buying is at least worth the money we're paying for and then some more. Um, because, you know, 60 cents a thousand is not the same as five or a dollar twenty-five. And so I think with data and the quality of the data, it's very important to know how much you're paying for it. Um, and what is that compared not to non-exposed? We all know advertising works or we would not have jobs. But um, what is, you know, the targeted audience compared to the non-targeted audience and the lift that it represents versus the money you're paying for? 
And there is a, an element comforting there, right? That you know how much you pay for the data and you know the returns that you're getting on your sales. So I don't have to be an expert and go chasing the quality of the data. I just need to experiment and determine whether it's worth the money or not I'm paying for. Well, the other really thing I want to add though is in this, as we go through all of this is, you know, the challenge with digital in particular is just the cost involved in all these non-media costs that, you know, when you think about TV and we transacted in TV for so many years, and yes, there's a cost to buy the rating system, but essentially, you know, the agencies are paying, it's built into our fee or into our overhead or whatever you want to call it. But anything we want to do digitally, we've got to pay. Hey, I want to do viewability, I got to pay. I do fraud protection, I got to pay. I want to buy some data, I got to pay. You know, there's so many, you know, I want to do closed loop studies, I got to pay. And it just, add, you know, that's the challenge is everything you want to do, whereas it would be great if this was just part of the ecosystem, it's just, it's measured. Right? And that includes all the partners being measured. But that's what makes it more challenging in digital is you have to consider every single thing that you want to do. Okay, do I have the money to pay for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you started to hit on, oh, there's a couple different directions I'd like to go with some of these. But uh, you hit on something that Blaze and I were talking about earlier, and, and maybe I'll point a question at Baba, which was you get what you pay for. Do you believe, so as we talk about the explosion of programmatic, and you guys have each started to shift a sizable investment into programmatic, uh, the use of data, even just paying the technology fees. I mean, Baba, would you agree you get what you pay for in this space today? So in other words, Sometimes premium CPMs are worth yes, what you're paying. Uh, invisible science research is quite expensive on a subscription <laughs> basis, <laughs> but you get what you pay for. for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. It's all you know, relative. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a different way of thinking about things because I think there, there has been this kind of classic way of talking about working media and, and non-working dollars. And uh, it, it's challenged by all of the kind of enhancements uh, protections and data that you can get um, that are kind of outside of, of classic working media, but actually help the outcome that you're trying to get to. Yep. Try to explain that to a finance guy, though, who just wants to look at working versus non-working. <laughs> that, that, that gets to the culture part. It does, though, absolutely. Talking, well, talking yeah, about, so absolutely. I, and before we, as we get ready to wrap up here, I actually, I did kind of want to go back to the culture piece and, and get an answer from each of you on this, because you've all touched on something here. Uh, which was about talent. I think, Baba, you brought up the word talent, and you want to work with talented people. I know Amaya can tell you, when, when JSD and I were at Kellogg, we said, you know, we just want to work with talented people, and, and we look for partners, not vendors, and we wanted to see talented people, and we believed in talented people and the power of that. But you talked about, I think, Fernando, today's marketer, if you're hiring a marketer, a new marketer today, they've got to look a lot different than they did 10 years ago, I would imagine. So I'm very curious with all this that we've talked about, the skill sets necessary, the understanding of how to effectively reach consumers with an idea, bring, a message, bring an idea to a message and, and reach consumers. It's quite different today than it was 10 years ago. How do you look for today's marketer? Um, that's a, we could spend, we'll, we'll have drinks tonight and talk about that. That's a long one. And um, I know you've got Heather, so yeah. you've got one. I got it going Check there, mark. yeah. That, I, that was, that's a huge win. Um, I, I think for today's market, I think one of the most interesting dynamics that seems to have changed over the past 10 years is um, someone would come into someone's office and they'd say, hey, um, we want to do something differently than it was done before. And the person would say, no, you can't do it because of this reason, this reason, this reason we did it. And we tried that with Walmart and it doesn't work. And then the person would go back, right? And now the dynamic is if someone comes into someone's office and the first thing they say is, say is you can't do it for this reason and this reason and this reason because we've done it before, like in our organization, that's seen as like a massive blocking and it's like, how do we overcome that? And those people become pariahs, right? So I think if I was going to hire for a marketing person today, I would um, find out whatever that person's passionate about in the interview process. It's just one of the, you know, one of many things you look for, right? You'd probably want people who have done a, maybe a variety of different things. We still hire our brand guys who have MBAs, so that's probably gonna happen, that's not gonna change anytime soon. But I would interview and see like, if this person, let's say their hobby is playing tennis, I think part of the interview process would be, I would ask them about tennis, and I would start to ask them questions about completely unorthodox things in tennis, like have you ever tried to do this, and just see how they reacted. And if they shut me down, I'd be like, you're not gonna work it out in this place. We need people who are at least open-minded. It could be anything. It could be whatever hobby you think, cooking, photography. But I think if, if you have people who shut stuff down, 
those are the people who it's not just bad for whatever that project is, but it slows the organization down. And our, we're at a place now where we need to move, and we reward people who will move things more quickly um, because they're the ones that are going to help us get to where we need to go. Love it. Um, I'm fortunate enough to not be in that conundrum, but what I can tell you about our own marketers is that I've seen um, very much the process that they have undertaken and the, the amount of trips that they made to not only my desk, but your desk at the time that you were there, uh, to find out more about um, programmatic and data-driven and all those pieces. And I believe the marketer of the future will have all those components. Um, the ones that are marketed today, they need and are coming up to speed. The ones of tomorrow probably will be even bred and born in places like Crocs or, um, or data-driven, you know, other pieces of the ecosystem. But, um, but even the ones that are already there are coming up to speed. They have to. They won't be marketers tomorrow if they don't. Baba, from your perspective, are you going to pass it? Oh, I was just going to, I was going to offer <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to you know, repeat uh, the things that, that Fernando and Amaya said. The only thing I would say is in our organization, we are definitely changing the structure of our organization. We're adding new roles in and around you know, data and analytics and campaign management and content and media optimization and programmatic. So there's a lot of things that we're looking to add capabilities on and bring some of those things or beefing up some of our capabilities in-house to handle all the complexities and kind of deal with the the agileness that we need as an organization to move and start to make like the creative you were talking about how do we do that much faster so those are the kinds of things that we're, we're doing as an organization so baba leave us with a call to action I'm gonna, I'll, I'll guide you to give yeah. us a little yeah. call to action here. yeah so i i actually loved how uh tom started us off this morning when he was going through his uh, his kind of his morning session uh his his path through it was were four principles that held true from the kitchen table to today at Crux. And I, I, I just love the idea of, look, we, we live in a time of massive complexity. It's so easy to get convoluted and get kind of lost in the, in the last hot thing that everyone's talking about. And the, the path through that is to have, like shining like a beacon, the core principles that are the things that you and your team say, this matters, and everything's going to be judged up against that. So I would say decide what those are and stick to it. I love it. I think we went a little bit over time. So I think, I think our guest, and uh, yeah, I was turning around too. Thanks to Aaron and the panel. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you.